Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome again so as you know we were discussing our fifth principle and that is uh, called uh, trade can make each party better off and uh, using uh, principle of absolute advantage of uh, proposed by adam smith we have already discussed that using a two country two commodity framework right so we will discuss today same principle how trade can make each party better off even when there is no absolute advantage or rather two countries one of them have absolute advantage in both the commodity production over the another country okay still in that case how trade can make each party better off each of them better off okay so as you can see in the screen that what production matrix was there for the two countries we have considered england and portugal and two commodities we have considered with wine and cloth so let us go to the another kind of uh, similar kind of uh, two cross two kind of situation where the same countries but we are changing the payoff structure or payoff this not payoff that this production structure a little bit different way so suppose suppose this is the production structure okay so here is wine here is cloth okay here is england here is portugal suppose the production scenario is like this here 2 here 12 as it was in the earlier case but for the portugal now suppose this is 1 and this is 8 let me repeat or let me remind you what this number means okay whatever uh, productive resources england has using that entire resource vector if england wants to produce only wine it can produce two units of wine alternatively if it can employ entire resource vector into production of only cloth it can produce or it can be able to produce only 12 units of cloth or it can uh, allocate some amount of uh, in uh, resources for wine production some amount of resources for cloth production and production will be accordingly okay proportionally change okay the same way if portugal it can assign all of its uh, resources into only wine production it, it can be able to produce only one unit of wine and similarly it can produce alternatively only eight unit of cloths so in this kind of scenario what will be what will be these two countries uh, production scenario in a diagram like the earlier thing the way we, we represent the diagram suppose we are measuring say cloth here wine here okay so suppose this is 2 this is 1 suppose this is 12 so this is 8 so So, definitely 2, 1, 8, 12 here 0, 0 origin. Okay. So, this is the production possibility frontier for England and this is the production possibility frontier for say Portugal. Now, you can see that in this particular scenario uh, given the numbers we have taken England has absolute advantage in production of both the commodities okay because England can produce wine more than Portugal in England can produce cloth also more than Portugal okay so from the principle of at absolute advantage if we if we try to understand here we are getting an apparent feeling that uh, trade can't make each party better off rather if they engage into trade only portugal can get benefited england may not be able because england has already has absolute advantage in production of both the commodities but that is not the case we will demonstrate how even in this case trade can make each of them better off okay so in this particular situation what we have to we have to see or uh, focus 
uh, we have to focus here in the comparative ad advantage or relative advantage if any of them has in any of the two commodities production. Okay. Relate to find out comparative advantage. So, we are discussing now uh, trade on the basis of principle of principle of comparative advantage comparative or this is sometimes called a relative also relative advantage. And as we told this concept first uh, introduced uh, by David Ricardo, David Ricardo. So, look at here what is the opportunity cost of wine for England vis a vis what is the opportunity cost of Portugal for wine for Portugal. Okay. And when we are discussing this opportunity cost, if you can remember when we introduced the concept of opportunity cost in our last lecture. So, in terms of the other commodities like when we introduced the one piece of land, a, a farmer either can produce rice or he can produce uh, jute. So, what is the opportunity cost of rice? How much he is going to lose from not cultivating jute and vice versa. right? So, in this particular case, 2 unit wines opportunity cost is 12 units of cloth. Okay. In, in, in the sense that if England wants to produce 2 units of wine, it has to sacrifice 12 units of cloth, because if it wants to produce only wine, it cannot produce any amount of cloth that is why in that sense. So, 2 wine and cloth for England and for Portugal. So, 2 units of wine if England wants to produce, then it has to sacrifice 12 units of cloth. Okay. So, if England wants to produce 1 unit of wine, definitely it has to sacrifice 6 units of cloth. Right? So, opportunity cost scenario if we plot in a, another diagram suppose here, this is the opportunity cost opportunity cost scenario right here is england here is portugal here is wine here is cloth when we are discussing opportunity cost it is a per unit of one commodity in that sense so for england to produce per unit of wine, its opportunity cost is 6 unit of cloth. Okay. Alternatively, uh, for England, opportunity cost per unit of cloth is 1 by 6 unit of wine. Okay. So, when you are, you are finding out the in, for England, what is the opportunity cost of cloth, it is basically you have to ask the question in this way to produce 12 units of cloth, it has to sacrifice 2 units of wine. So, produced 1 unit of cloth, how much wine it has to sacrifice? So, it will be 2 by 12 units. So, that is 1 by 6. Exactly same way for wines, uh, opportunity cost for Portugal, it is 8 units of cloth. Vis a vis, cloth's opportunity cost for Portugal is 1 upon 8. Okay. And as you can remember when we introduced this in, the, in our last lecture that we have to take a decision or we have to choose to produce that commodity whose opportunity cost is less. So, suppose here wines production in case of wines production England's opportunity cost is 6 units of cloth, Portugal's opportunity cost is 8 units of cloth. So, whose, for whom opportunity cost is less? Of course, for wine production, for wine production, England's opportunity cost is less vis a vis Portugal. And exactly the, the same way for cloth production, Portugal's opportunity cost is less than England because 1 upon 8 is less than 1 upon 6, right. So, as per the principle of comparative advantage, it is, it is advisable for these two countries if this is the production scenario. Okay. England should specialize only in wine production and Portugal is uh, should specialize only in cloth production. Let me repeat why England should specialize, specialize what is the meaning of specialize, 
we mentioned in our last lecture. Specialized means it should produce only that commodity and not any anything else. In this particular scenario, only two commodities are there. So, since England's wines production opportunity cost is less than Portugal's wines production opportunity cost, so England should specialize only in wine production. Exactly the same way, since crop production opportunity cost for Portugal is less than opportunity cost of crop production for England, Portugal should specialize in crop production and they should engage into trade to make each of them better off. Okay. So, suppose in this particular case as per the relative advantage principle of relative advantage result what we are getting England, England should specialize wine production and Portugal should specialize cloth production. So, definitely what how much wine and how much cloth will be produced? Definitely England could produce 2 units of wine and Portugal will produce 8 units of cloth, right. Now, if they can engage into trade, okay, whether that trade will make each of them better off in this kind of situation or not that is our, our consideration now. So, obviously you can think of that uh, in the absence of any trade, Portugal can consume any point bounded by this green triangular kind of area because this line, this outer border of the green, green line, okay, this is the production possibility frontier for Portugal. So, without engaged into trade, it cannot consume any point beyond that line, right. Exactly the same way, this red line is the production possibility frontier for England. It cannot consume any point beyond that red line in the absence of trade, right. So, if we can somehow show that, that some consumption point which is beyond this green line for Portugal and another consumption point which is beyond the red line for England, it ca we can prove that or it will be proved that uh, each of them are getting better off. So, in this particular case, crux is that they should uh, fix the terms of trade in between this opportunity cost ratio, right. So, England's opportunity cost for wine is 6 units of cloth. Portugal's opportunity cost of wine is 8 units of cloth. So, if they fixed the trade ratio in between 6 and 8, say suppose it is 1 is to 7, in between they are fixing that trade ratio. Then we can show that each of them can get better off if by participating that trade. What does this 1 is to 7 means? They will engage into trade in such that for 1 unit of wine, 7 units of cloth it will be transacted in that ratio in the international trade, right. Since England already produce uh, specialized wine production and Portugal will specialize in cloth production, so England should produce wine and transact wine to get cloth from Portugal. And just exactly the same way, Portugal should only produce cloth and transact that cloth through in trade with England to get wine, okay. Now, if the trade ratio is 1 is to 7, that means what? For 1 unit of wine, 7 units of cloth, that is the transaction ratio in the trade, right. So, suppose England is specializing in wine production. So, England is producing only 2 units because that is the maximum amount it can produce and Portugal is specializing only cloth. So, it can produce only 8 units of cloth, right. So, suppose out of these 2 units of wine what England is producing, England is selling out of that to 1 unit of wine to Portugal to get 7 units of cloth from Portugal. Okay. So, effectively what England will consume? England will consume 1 unit of wine and 7 units of cloth because remaining 1 unit of wine it is trading with Portugal to get 7 units of cloth from Portugal, right. So, England's consumption point will be 1, one unit of wine and 7 units of cloth. Look at here, this is the England's production possibility from this red line, okay. So, this side wine highest point is 2 and this side 12. So, if we get, get proportionally 1 against it must be this point must be 6, right. So, 1 
1 unit of wine and 7 units of cloth must be this point, this is 7, somewhere 7, right. So, look at here if England produce on only 2 units of wine and one of those 2 units it transact with Portugal to get 6 units of cloth in return from Portugal, England can consume the point 17. 17 means 1 units of in, in this diagram it is basically 7 1 ok, because horizontal axis 7 and vertical axis 1, but ok. So, I am writing ok. So, it is it is basically 7 1 this point England can consume in the absence of trade if England wants to consume 1 units of wine maximum it can consume 6 units of cloth if England wants to be self sufficient domestically and without participating into trade ok. Look at from uh, Portugal's point of view, Portugal is trading uh, producing 8 units of cloth, out of that 7 units of uh, cloth it is giving to England to get 1 unit of wine. So, ultimately Portugal how consuming how much? Portugal is consuming 1 1 point, 1 1 point means 1 unit of cloth and 1 unit of wine. Why 1 unit of cloth? Because it produces 8 units of cloth, out of that 7 units of cloth it is giving to England, in return it is getting 1 unit of cloth from uh, 1 unit of wine from England. So, it is it produced 8 units, 8 units of cloth and no wine after trade it is consuming or it is getting 1 unit of cloth and 1 unit of wine, right. So, in absence of trade if England wants to produce a consume a Portugal, this is Portugal scenario we are discussing, Portugal wants to consume 1 unit of wine, it should be able to consume only no cloth or 0 units of cloth we can tell, right. So, 1 0 is a point in Portugal's within the Portugal's consumption possibilities in the absence of trade, but if England, Portugal participate in the trade 1 1 point this point 1 1 is somewhere here suppose this is 1. So, that point 1 1 point Portugal can consume England can consume this point. Mind that this consumption point is beyond each of their respective production possibility frontier. What does it mean? Let me reiterate, it means that if they want to be self sufficient whatever they can consume, if they want to only specialize in production of that commodity where it has comparative advantage or relative advantage in production and then engage into trade, they can uh, each of them can be uh, benefited. Okay. So, with this kind of uh, example or this kind of uh, simple two commodity, two country example, we can successfully demonstrate that how trade can make each party better off. Let me clarify, we are discussing, uh, we are continuing in our uh, last lectures, uh, we are, we have dis, uh, started discussion of 10 principles, right. These 10 principles uh, are there in the chapter, in fact that is the chapter 1 of the book we are following, right. So, this principle number 5 that trade can make each party better off, whatever is discussion in that book all this England, Portugal, this kinds of example is not there, ok. It is very, very small section, but chapter 3 there is a detailed discussion of all those things, ok. The title of that chapter is interdependence and gain from trade. So, we will skip that chapter because whatever is there in chapter 3 we are exhaustively discussing here and we completed this thing, ok. Let us go to our next principle, principle number 6. Okay. As you can remember principle number 5 was that trade can make each party better off. Okay. Let us go to uh, principle number 6, next principle, principle number 6. Market, market you know we defined uh, in the last lecture, market is usually a good way to organize economic activities. Okay. 
let us clarify using certain certain example certain real life phenomenon across the globe and all see i hope that many of you or almost all of you know about the communism okay erstwhile communist countries like soviet uh, russia and some eastern european countries okay they are uh, communism was there or communist system was there. In that system, there is a powerful central planner is there, okay, which is known as commune. That commune will decide for the entire country within the society, how what to be produced, who will produce that okay, and whatever is produced out of that, how much which family or which person how much we will get to consume and all those things. So, there is a central planner which is called commune or government there, they dictate in every economic activities within the country. But as you know that that kind of systems have been eventually abandoned and even those countries are still uh, Russia and uh, certain Eastern, Eastern European countries where this communism or communist this system was existing sometimes back in until 1980s, 19, uh, early 1990s or sometimes until that time. Now, they also go to the market economy. What is the market economy? Instead of this kind of central planner who is dictating everybody what to produce, how to produce, how much to produce or something like that and who or in a in a in other way we can tell that commune is dictating the entire economy uh, to allocate uh, how resource will be allocated within that society, right. But vis a vis that market economy is what? Here resources, whatever is there in the, within the society, how that will be shared, that will be allocated across the agents of that economy or different households, different farms or different economic agents within that society. Okay. That will not be dictated by any central planner, any government or any uh, benevolent uh, leader kind of thing, rather it will be through market mechanism. What is the advantage of that for the market mechanism? Look at, look at the situation, see uh, say I am a farmer. Okay. I produce a sugar cane right? and uh, when I produce sugar cane right, I am expecting that by selling that sugar cane in the market perhaps I will earn some money. right? So, I have certain expectation if I want to go to the market say maybe per piece of sugar cane how much rupee I will get say per, perhaps uh, 20 rupees or 30 rupees something like that. right? So, now that 20 rupee or 30 rupee whatever I will get selling one piece of sugar cane who determines that? That actually in the market economy that determine that is determined by uh, demand supply forces prevail in the market. You can see that one day it can happen that the sugar cane with which I, I enter into the market not that much customers are there for my sugar cane. So, even if I expect that say perhaps uh, per piece of sugar cane say 25 rupees okay, that uh, per, uh, I, I may have to reduce that price little bit to be able to sell all the sugar canes I brought into the market. Another day it can happen that because that day uh, demand for my product is not enough or is not sufficient uh, to be absorbed the entire amount of sugar cane what I supplied in the market. Another day may be some, some uh, festival day okay, uh, certain rituals are there so, suppose in South India in Tamil Nadu and other, other parts of South India there is a uh, festival called Pungal. And, and essential uh, component of that uh, celebration of that pongol is a sugar cane. Okay. So, sugar cane is an essential commodity of the part of the ritual related to that particular festival. So, that day you will see that uh, demand for sugar cane is huge okay. and even if you expect that you will get 25 uh, rupees per sugar cane. Uh, you will realize that eventually uh, certain people are there, they are even willing to give even maybe 40 rupees per uh, sugar cane, right. So, how, how much supply of the any product, I give an example using sugar cane, this is true for any goods, it is true for any services. Okay? So, in the background silently market mechanism is playing a role to allocate that is a resource, what I produce is that is a resource, right that resource to the potential customers. Okay. 
So, it is so, so in a market economy in a market system uh, whatever the price is determined at which the any commodity or any services will be transacted that is not determined by unlike in the commune system any 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 a central planner rather silent forces of millions of uh, farms and households and individual economic agents transaction ok demand supply transaction forces in the market ok. And it is this kind of market mechanism is so powerful and nobody can see that how it is working right, but you will realize that one day price is little bit less another day price is little bit above and all these things are happening and silently market forces are operating in the more specifically demand supply forces are operating for that particular commodity or any, any sort of other commodities or services ok. So, it is so powerful that you know that we told that Adam Smith he is called uh, father of economics as we mentioned in sometimes earlier ok and uh, that principle of absolute advantage actually that that proposal he only uh, first uh, told or first uh, introduced that kind of uh, principle ok. So, Adam Smith in 1776 in that year uh, his book title an inquiry into the nature and an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. I think this is the title if I, I make a mistake or something you look at it is there in your book right. So, it is a very long title of his book this book has been published in 1776 and since it is a long title usually this book is called wealth of nations, wealth of nations sometimes it is referred as wealth of nations ok. So, this is the uh, his book. Uh, published in 1776 title is that. So, it is a very and uh, first uh, printed uh, book uh, in economics ok. So, that is why sometimes this Adam Smith is called uh, father of economics ok. So, uh, in his book Adam Smith referred market as invisible hand, invisible hand. So, now you understand in which sense he referred invisible land because as we clarified that market mechanism silently plays in the background as if uh, somebody is doing those activities or somebody is organizing those activities ok, but nobody can see that. So, that is why it is called invisible hand. So, he termed uh, this invisible hand this terminology first Adam Smith introduced. Okay. So, that is the thing that usually market is a very uh, powerful and very good uh, mechanism through which economic activities ha are organized in a uh, market economy and also since economic activities are organized resources are allocated across the agents of that society. Let me uh, make one clarification about the principle number 5 trade can make each party better off. See the two examples we gave one, one case absolute advantage another case relative advantage right. So, even when the absolute advantage kind of matrix when we utilize you will see uh, that yes uh, the kind of example you have taken England has absolute advantage in uh, cloth production and Portugal has absolute advantage in wine production absolute advantage ok in that way. Even if that case in that particular case if you want to find out out of these two countries who has relative advantage in which of the two commodities production you will realize that one of them have a relative advantage in production of one commodity and another of them has relative advantage in the production of the other commodity ok. So, uh, there are certain other uh, higher level principles are there hexarolin theorem and all others are there those are beyond the uh, scope of the present study for our syllabus uh, uh, principle of absolute advantage and principle of relative advantage are enough ok. But even in that case trade is happening on the basis of principle of relative advantage ok. Uh, why I am specifically telling this because even the case where you are seeing that it is on the basis of a absolute advantage if you see that relative advantage is also simul uh, uh, silently simultaneously operating. So, that is the uh, main basis 
Okay. Even if absolute advantage is not there, relative advantage may occur there, the kind of example we have taken today. Okay. And when absolute advantage is there, also relative advantage is there in the background in a hidden form, you can see and you can realize that. 